So we are here at number 160 Elof Street in the heart of Johannesburg to deep dive into a phenomenal story. One that is a shapeshifter when it comes to the world of arts, culture and fashion. Today we speak to Ladu Mangokolo, who is the founder of Matosa Africa. A business started back as early as 2010, just fundamentally based on a business case study and has metamorphosized into a juggernaut representing African pride, luxury and significance across the global stages. Join us for this conversation as we take a look at the business of fashion with Makosa. Such a pleasure to have you with us today, sir. Thank you so much, Sis Kuko. I must say we're excited to have you on this very special feature of Kaya Biz, which uh, does bring you the business of fashion as we're going to deep dive into the intricacies of the creative industry. Tatu Ngokolo, it's been a delight being with you today. I must tell you that I am very proud to be featured in what you dubbed the uh, Obama dress, right? Looking absolutely amazing. Thank you. So hopefully I'll also be able to uh, share some of the characteristics of Michelle Obama, who's actually worn a similar design of this nature. But Latuma, if we take it a few steps back, many people are very familiar with your brand, very familiar with the name, and of course the uh, sense of creativity that you've uh, penetrated into the global space. But as a refresher, take us back to 2010. Did you ever imagine that it would be this big for you? If I say that I did imagine, I'd be lying. But however, I did set a benchmark that this is how far I want to take this vision. In 2010, of course, I hadn't yet established a brand. It was a pieces project at the time. Mm. I got a great opportunity to be invited to submit my pieces project that I did at the Nelson Mandela University, to submit it at a global design competition, which, it, which was part of our curriculum. I won the South African leg of that competition and won the global leg of that competition as well, which gave me a platform for me to share the thesis project with the world. But I literally started talking about it publicly at the design in Durban in 2011. Yeah. And that's quite significant because what we're obviously establishing from this to build up a business and to have it transform into uh, the juggernaut that it is does come with a lot of training, the thesis that you provided, and of course international exposure because at some point you got the opportunity to study in London as well, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, uh, it, building a brand comes with a lot of academic knowledge that is demanded from you. If not you, then you'd have to get consultants to consult for you on that. In my case, I wanted to make sure that I know as much as possible. Of course, I did finish my degree at the Nelson Mandela University, but I felt like I was hungry for more. I got fortunate, fortunate enough to get a scholarship to study further at a school that they call Central St. Martins, which, which is known for being a, a, a school that has produced the likes of Alexandra McQueen, Stella McCartney, Jimmy Choo, and, and various other names that have done significant work around the fashion world. After I studied, I then felt like, you know what, in order to evolve my business even further and faster, mm -hmm. I need to move to the city of gold. 100%. And that also was quite a journey because you were in Cape Town before, came back from London, moved to the City of Gold. But I'm so intrigued, as you're mentioning these names that you've highlighted, Stella McCartney, Alexander McQueen, these are formidable brands on a global stage and they do give us some insight into the building of a business. I'm keen to understand your key experiences in building the business aspects of Matosa and what that journey looked like, specifically coming to Joburg where we're at your studios today. I think first of all, a great aspect in business that is maybe, I, I guess, I think is often taken for granted, is trust. Mm. Working with people that you trust makes half of the journey quite simple. I attracted some of my siblings to join into the business about eight years ago. And today they play quite significant. Significant hey, Latuma, let's tell the truth. Sometimes that's not easy, right? Because the family dynamics might uh, get blurred within the... Um... It's, not, it's not easy at all, but I do, however, recommend it for someone that is trying to build a business that would be a legacy. In my case, I want to build a dynasty that would, of course, be beneficial to my family, beneficial to society, and the rest of the continent. And benefit the value chain of the industry that I operate in. It comes with formalizing everything. I think that's the step that a lot of people skip. 
and also being realistic and frank with your family matters would would, would save a lot of talking issues. 100%. There's so many lessons that I'm picking up here and I'd like us to deep dive into perhaps three of those pillars, which is certainly formalizing the business, as you've mentioned, building a legacy, uh, and of course, trust through the partnerships that you've been able to form. Uh, and maybe building up on the trust as well as formalization, that brings us down to the value chain. A moment ago, we were talking about the state of uh, textiles as well as manufacturing in South Africa. Every other day on a business show like Kaya Biz, we bemoan the fact that there's load shedding, water cuts, not enough policy to protect us from Chinese imports. And I think this is so peculiar about uh, what you do as Makosa Africa is that you really do own the full value chain of not just being in fashion, but also operating in the textile space. For those who aren't familiar, talk us through the journey of actually crafting the netway that you create. We, we are not in the full value chain yet. But however, that the vision is to go as further as controlling the full value chain. Mm -hmm. You know, when it comes to fashion, of course, the, 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 the steps are quite simple. Normal fashion designers would go and buy fabric from a fabric stores. We don't. We are in the business of creating fabric. So we've got knitting machines. We specialize in knitting. Knitting is a very niche space to go into. Yeah. Um, However, a point to note, knitting is, is, is known to be the most important fabric construction in the world. So literally about 70% of fabrics that we wear as human beings are knitted. Interesting. Um, that's just the architectural structure of the, the material. That's the architectural structure of the material. Of course, there's various types of knitting, there's circular knitting, there's flatbed knitting. We specialize in flatbed knitting, uh -huh. meaning that the machine goes left and right. Um, lots of engineering that goes into it, um, mainly with German machinery. We, we, we produce our fabrics in-house using yarn slash thread that we get from Ekaber, uh -huh. my home city, yeah. um, that is made with sheep hair and a little bit of blend of silk. We also import yarn from Asia that is made of viscose, tensile, silk, cotton, and various other fibers. Sure. So just textile industry, the textile part of the business is quite dynamic on its own. Um, yes, of course, we are in the clothing manufacturing space as well. So we do CMT, we do retail, Mm -hmm. which is sort of the end part of the chain. That we get to experience as customers. Of course. Yeah. yeah. I think this is so important because what it does uh, emphasize is uh, understanding that you do have nuances of controlling not only the cost, but availability, supply chain. And most importantly, what you've highlighted is the circular economy, taking it back uh, from your hometown, which in itself does contribute to the overall South African economy. Why is that important to you as a South African entrepreneur? I think uh, as a South African <coughs> entrepreneur, especially specifically a black entrepreneur, mm -hmm. I should be concerned about the fact that we've got over 40% unemployment in this country. Uh, I think I should be concerned that we've got a lot of problems in Africa mm -hmm. that we will solve as African entrepreneurs and not people from outside the continent. Mm -hmm. I've got a choice, however, to go to Asia manufacture there, fill up warehouses around the world mm. and sell and make billions of dollars overnight, right? But then the trade-off with that is that I would lose value of what I'm doing yeah. in a short space of time and chances are it wouldn't be the legacy that I ulti ultimately wanted to build. So in this matter, money that doesn't matter more than the vision and impact mm. that I'm trying to build around the business. So um, my priorities had to be straightforward when I came into the industry. Is that easy though, as a young entrepreneur, when there's billions being thrown at you, cheaper options? Um, and as we know, sometimes people do tend to get lost, not only in the fame, but the fortune that you can accumulate very quickly. It has been easy for me, I have to say. Um, not to say that I'm a, I'm a tough person. Um, it has been easy because I only have one plan. That is plan A. There's no plan B, mm. right? So if I come across any tempting circumstance, 
I wouldn't really take it if it doesn't align with the the, the vision of the business. Mm. And, and therefore, um, yes, there are alternatives of making our clothes in Italy mm. at a high price margin. There is an alternative of moving to another country and be a creative director of a prominent high-end brand. But however, uh, priorities, my priorities uh, are, are still centered within my home. Um, we recently showcased a new collection in France, which we called My Conviction. Yes. Uh, if you read through the lines, you would get a clear idea of the intentions that we forcefully implement within our brand mm -hmm. so that people would know what we stand for. Mm -hmm. As I'm listening to this and reflecting on your journey, I, I'm, I'm tying it back to the theme of legacy that you highlighted, but also skills. And to share this vision with a number of people who help you support building this business as well as the brand, sometimes can be easy and sometimes can be met with a few challenges because again, not everyone might be aligned in terms of that vision. And I'm keen to understand how you have kept consistent with the messaging internally, with the staff that we have all the way downstairs, you know, assisting with the textiles to those who operate at a retail level, and even the larger clients that you interact with on an international scale, making sure that they fully grasp and understand the vision which has led to the growth of the business so far. I personally think that the best form of guideline that you can use to make sure that your colleagues are in, the, are in the same vision journey as you is setting a great example yourself. Yeah. So um, I have to show what I mean, basically, to my colleagues. I have to live the brand. I have to have great values as the entrepreneur behind the business. Of course, there are small sessions that we share every now and then where I share the vision with them and and also open up the space for other people to have their own opinion as well. So basically, Matosa is not entirely based on my vision. You know, I, I do allow the space for my colleagues to, to, to give their opinion mm. um, and not dictate. Um, and, and also, um, we are a diverse brand. And there's often a very naive question that people ask. Yeah. Oh, the brand is called Matosa. Do are all the employees Tosa people? Like, oh. <laughs> we live in we live in a modern society. Exactly. Jovek is a melting pot of multiple multiple beautiful cultures from around the continent. Um I think diversity brings innovation within our organization. We get to understand other other cultures better mm -hmm. and get to embrace them better. Um, by the knowledge that we accumulate from, from our colleagues. Um, and in terms of customer interactions, we always try to engage with our customers as much as we can. Of course, also allow feedback from them. Yes. And you'd be surprised on how well integrated some of our customers are into our business. Tell us more about that. And I ask this only because sometimes when some people think of Africa and luxury, they think it's an oxymoron and just doesn't go well together. Yeah. But clearly you've been part of the shapeshifters who have uh, um, uh, evolved this understanding. So what is it that your customers say? Who's your typical client? Um, uh, and how intricately close are they with the brand? Um, I think, well, f for me, I've never seen a, a massive separation between African luxury and luxury in general. Mm -hmm. I've always seen the two as, 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 as well paired together. Of course, we had to position our brand at that caliber um, from a retail level, from customer level. In fact, some of the customers that we've accumulated over the years aren't really customers that we really started from the bottom up with. Okay. Some have been random shoppers that were walking past other luxury stores, maybe at the Millionaire's Mile Walk at the V&A Waterfront in Cape Town. We built a relationship with them from there. Um, uh, if I could make an example, some of the customers that are like well vested into our vision, that, that know the back end of the business, are your Tede Kalafeng, mm. uh, who's the owner and founder of um, 
um, brand Africa. Yes, brand Africa, yeah. And, 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 and Mzamo Musito, Dr. Yes. Mzamo Musito, uh, who is the marketing manager of Google. Google Africa. 100%. Um, Can't so, forget to see Sunati. She's Sisunati, been the face of, of the brand. This Unati guy. Um, so when they see where they can add value, they can. We sit down, they, they, they express their opinion. Where they see things that are out of place, mm. they come and, and, and lay their opinion as well. That's value that is beyond monetary value mm. that these brand disciples contribute to our business. Um, yes, of course, I could be stubborn. I could, be, could have been a stiff entrepreneur and be like, please don't be derogatory. Don't tell me what to do. I see. Right? But these are professionals and people that I respect that want to see the brand grow. What I find so encouraging is that you're not looking at them through the uh, lens of just the public eye and the public figures that they are, but you actually incorporated them as uh, brand disciples. That's the word that you actually use, which is very telling. Of course, maybe some uh, of our audience members are keen to understand international reach. You know, mm. are we seeing that we're breaching the divides in terms of race, race, color, uh, as well as international divides with the clients and customers of the brand? Um, our customers are quite diverse in, 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 in terms of... Uh, our customer base um, we have customers as far as LA Amanda says mm. for instance New York Black Thought Music Soul Child Rafael Sadiq Swiss Beats the list is endless that's an impressive list like, uh, like you must sit back at some point and think actually I'm I'm very proud of myself yeah, and the team no 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 we do give ourselves a lot sometimes because these specific people that we're speaking about, some of them are organic lovers of the brand. Yes. So it's people that saw it somewhere and couldn't pass, went online, purchased. So when you look at the back end on Shopify, you realize that, yo, Amanda Sills just bought a lot of pieces. Right. Um, it is a, 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 a very fascinating, uh, like, evolution that is often unbelievable but then we live in a digital world right the advantage that we we get we get to benefit as this generation is that what we do is not limited within the territories that we operate 100 percent. it has the potential to go way beyond like uh, we've got italian and, and 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 english shoppers you know that we often ask when we do research, yeah. we ask them, how do you know about the brand? Like, what made you think? And some of those customers, they've never been to South Africa. They don't know nothing about South Africa. They just saw a good product that would look good on them. Fantastic. Well, if you've just joined us, we are in conversation with the founder of Makosa Africa, Latuma Ngokolo, who's joining us to talk all things about the business of fashion here on this Kaya Biz and Kaya 959 special broadcast with myself, Kukule Tumfupi. As you've heard, we've spoken about the legacy, we've spoken about the background, we've spoken about the importance of skills and the intricacies of making sure that you own a space and a piece of the value chain in order to broaden the growth, the scope and the development of the business. But... What you've mentioned, which is so critical, but like Duma, is of course making sure that you are a global brand, you've tapped into the minds and the insights of your clients, and that's where I'd like to go. Uh, number one, taking a look at the opportunities that have come up in New York, of course looking at how you've become a global citizen, but still very keen on plowing back here at home through your culture fest. And maybe let's start there, because as you've mentioned, you just came back from Paris, uh, opening up uh, new opportunities within New York, but even coming back here in South Africa and Jobik specifically to make sure that you have your culture fest. Talk us through this dynamic of the global competitiveness, but still being locally relevant. Yes. I think that um, competing globally, of course, is, 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 is important. But however, as much as the global scene is big, right, at home, you have to make sure that you have got a solidified client base, a solidified infrastructure, in a case where a brand that is from overseas comes into South Africa, they have to acknowledge the fact that there is a brand yeah. that is actually moving and shaping things over here. Mm -hmm. That is the objective that we always wanted to push as a brand, that 
if it ever happens that we are not accepted in certain territories, we, we know that we still have home love. Definitely. True love. And you know where I want to go with this as well is the example of what happened in 2018, where one of the large retail stores, Zara, was actually selling uh, imitations in terms of the prints of your socks. And it yeah. was a lot of South African consumers who called them out on that. I'm keen to understand both the dynamic of, again, the local support where customers and clients are calling them out, but also the legal challenges of mm. taking on these retail giants who could be assisting you in terms of broadening scale, but essentially are imitating your IP. Yeah, yeah. What was that like? It, it was an eye-opening experience and also getting a little bit of context of how people are, are so behind you. Literally, when I first saw those socks online, mm -hmm. like they were listed on their website. But then I got like three messages from someone in New York that saw them at the store, someone in Germany and someone in London. And then South Africans started posting. Yeah. Literally the next day, the socks were pulled out all the stores globally sure. and on, on on their online store mm. that is the power of the social media mm. of course um throughout the whole litigation process which is still ongoing by the way it's still ongoing <laughs> like do yeah. i tell us more because i think there's a big lesson here as well about uh, the protection of intellectual property especially yeah. for people in the creative space it impacts mm. your business in, in various ways, as you say, and, yeah. and maybe there's some developments or changes that you would like to see policymakers maybe implement, mm. regulators also review. Uh, what's yeah. lacking there to make sure that our IP really is ours and is adequately protected? I think the regulation system, I think starting with how prostitution processes take go in South Africa, there is a, a super lack of justice in that space. Mm. If people were, 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 were scared of the justice system. Of, co of course, there wouldn't be much uh, disrespect and, 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 and counterfeits and uh, IP yeah. uh, infringement out there. I think that our government is still taking IP infringement lightly. Um, they'll only realize when it's too late on how counterfeits are affecting sports brands, mm. international brands that are they are operating in South Africa, luxury brands. Uh, in this day and age, it's us as well now that are part of the, 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 the of these cases. Um, of course, there is a legal and, 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 and law and, 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 and policy of yeah. side of IP, which is not really being put out there in public as, 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 much, as much as it should, mm -hmm. right? So Abandu in general often get confused mm. on what certain boundaries are when it comes to IP infringement. It's not common knowledge. Sure. Uh, in fact, I feel like at this stage, even law IP firms that, 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 that specialize in IP, they don't even have much power. <laughs> They don't even have much power than the actual power on paper mm. because on the ground yes they do take papers and serve them to sars to make sure that counterfeits don't come in through the devon seaport at, at, at or tambo airport um in essence we are not protected mm. is there anything that you and your colleagues are doing though as a united front especially those with who play within the realm of african luxury in south africa um there's not the, internally we are formulating a, a campaign clearly the legal route doesn't work yeah we've been, we've spent hundreds of thousands trying to stop uh, counterfeits of our work um we realize that such as uh, industry is a a mafia industry right so we, we we shouldn't much intervene in that but however um it does sort of create a form of awareness you know mm. with a little bit of damage um i think that south africans business owners individuals entrepreneurs should gather together and 
make a more powerful impact to stop whatever uh, in, intellectual in, intellectual property infringement. It's not gonna take one law firm yeah. to change all that. It's not gonna take an individual. It's gonna take a community. Definitely. Yeah. And a community that also involves us as consumers and, and South African citizens that, yes, in as much as you might look for a great bargain because you want to look fantastic in Makosa attire, but go to the original source to make sure that you're able to uh, not only contribute to the economy, but also understand the, the damaging consequences of um, supporting counterfeit goods and the impact not only on the economy, but your brand. Yeah. Uh, and of course, you know, just the livelihoods of South African lives. And I think this then does take us back to the culture fest, because mm -hmm. through this, again, like you said, you're cultivating that local connection with us as South African consumers to say, these are our brands, we take pride in them, and we are in touch with understanding mm -hmm. the journey uh, that these these particular brands and businesses have really curated. What's going to be different about the Culture Fest that's happening in 2024 versus what we saw last year? And more importantly, I'm aware that you've got a very busy traveling schedule after that. How does that set the tone and the pace for the remainder of the year when it comes to Makosa Africa? What will be happening at this year's Cultural Festival that is different from last year is, of course, there'll be a different collection. Yes. <laughs> Are you breaking some news? I thought we'd spot something in the showroom here today. <laughs> not yet. Not yet. Okay. Not yet. Um, so the, the fashion show is the main attraction of the, the festival. Of course, there is music, uh, food, curated food, and there's a bar service that will be provided courtesy by Conca. And um, we, 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 we will have activations like we did last year where we showcase how Matwasa pieces are manufactured. Um, we did do one or two collaborations, special collaborations. We did a collaboration with a Cape Town based brand called Field Bar. Yes. And collab collaborated with them on a strap. Yes. Um, literally, when we listed those Field Bars online to be sold to people that attend the, the festival, they sold out within a couple of hours. Um, people are loving them. Mm. And, the cooler box itself is very popular. I can imagine once you add a Makosa strap, it's... Popular. Believe me, like, I've never seen <laughs> that much of the praise for just a cooler box. Right. And in fact, the, 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 the 120 units that we got from them was by luck because they've got a long waiting list of people that want to purchase them. But... Um, those are some of the special touches that we have for the festival. Fantastic. There are new products that we've launched within our line. We will break some of those products at the festival. Fantastic. And I'm really encouraged by the collaborative efforts, especially between South African brands who are working together to grow. I want to venture into the fact that you are still going to be traveling extensively this year, continuing to build the global brand that is uh, Makosa. What will be different in terms of objectives and goals that you have for 2024? Because it's more than 10 years in the game now. Yeah. Taking it to <laughs> another level. Yeah, it's, 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 it's been 13 years into the game. Um, the stage where we at as a brand now is to look at expanding more out of the country. We've literally closed each and every corner of South Africa. So we've opened up stores in all the major cities of South Africa and ended it off at the Oar Tambo duty free area. Yes. Which is the exit point of us to the world. Mm. New York is, is is going to be of course where we will start. Yes. Um because for the past ten years we've accumulated a number of customers there. And that is where we get online sales the most outside South Africa. Oh wow. Yeah. Um, After New York are there any other jurisdictions? After New York, not much. Eh? Only small pieces here and there in London and Europe um, and other parts of the world. New York has uh, super expressive when yeah. it comes to dressing and, and, and it's also vocal. So it is quite an interesting market to tap into. Definitely. New York, here you come. Fly, flying the South African uh, flag quite high. 
I, I'm so encouraged by this conversation, Bukla because you've really taken us on a journey of understanding where you started, mm -hmm. what the goal and the vision is, and really sticking to legacy, making sure that they keep partnerships, the skills as well. And of course, as you highlighted, the fact that we do need to protect the IP of our industry, though there are some challenges that we're experiencing on that front. I'd like to close this conversation off on a personal note. Mm. And you mentioned a short while ago that legacy is critical for you. Mm. You're expanding your family as well. You're continuing to grow your business. And of course, that takes us to perhaps defining and understanding what the Makosa legacy is, even without you playing a critical role in it. The Makosa legacy is quite simple and straightforward. It is the vision behind the brand is to reimagine culture which is what we've been doing since day one but however the ultimate goal is to play a huge impact in the african fashion and textile economy um, which will definitely benefit agriculture and various other industries um, we want to change the misconception that people have about culture in general we want to change the misconception that African, proudly African goods cannot be luxury. We want to change that a global business can be built from Johannesburg mm -hmm. and have roots in the Eastern Cape, can be built to become a global business. Those are some of the legacies and 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 misconceptions that we that I personally wanted to change when I came into the industry. Um I think we've done half of the job. Yep. From the change part. The rest that is left is of course the the the, the, the commerce commercialization mm -hmm. of the business. Of course with with ethics, um, with um with humility, specifically Ubuntu. Um, because Ubuntu is completely different from humility. Mm. Um, and that, I think that is what makes us different from a lot of brands, is that if you walk into our stores, uh, majority of people are welcome with Ubuntu. Mm. I'm a shop as well, right? When I walk into other spaces, you do realize that, you know what, Ubuntu is, 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 is not a common practice for us, for us all. That is the legacy that I want to continue as a thread, even though, even if I'm not involved in the business or somewhat distant from it. Hundred percent, Dr. Mokolo, seabule laga cool. You've really been an amazing guest with us today, uh, giving us some insight into the business of fashion, taking us into the genesis of your story, but most importantly, even tying it to the golden thread, literally, of making sure that we build a formidable business of the future that is rooted in Ubuntu. Thank you so much for your time today. Fantastic. Well, that brings us to the end of this amazing conversation. And we hope that you've certainly gained a lot more knowledge, insight, and have been left inspired, most importantly, that truly African, proudly African brands can compete globally. We can do so by competing with our international counterparts, but most importantly, making sure that we still make a significant contribution to our local communities through ongoing partnerships and camaraderie with uh, individuals who will be advocates for the brand, understanding how as market leaders we continue to penetrate forward in terms of breaking the threshold and making sure that our industries are protected. And most importantly, despite the headwinds that we might experience, still making sure that we are globally competitive and locally relevant in our market while still making sure that we take our communities forward. It's been a blast having you here for our special Kaya Biz Business of Fashion conversation here on Kaya 959. Be sure to give us your feedback here on social media. From myself, Gugule Tumfufi, take care.